Hello, 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 everybody. Hello, welcome to Inspire Ministries Live. We are live. It is Monday, October 5th. I had to look at my calendar and see what day it was. Wasn't really quite sure what day it was today. Welcome for those of you who are joining us on live live tonight on our uh, Journaling with Jesus page. I just welcome you to our live event and I'm so thankful that you are here and that you have chosen to join us. I know that um, this time and day does not work for everybody. So um, if in fact you are watching this on replay, hello to I'm so glad that you are here uh, with us and um, joining us. Hello, Katrina. Hello, Deb. So glad to see you both here tonight. Hello, hello, hello. It was so good to see you. Um, we are just uh, starting in tonight and going to go live as soon as a few people are going to go. We are live, but going to go uh into our Bible study as a few join us, as a few more join us. Hello, Miss Julie. Nice to have you here today. I think that is my first time seeing you on a live. So welcome. We are so thankful that you are here. Hello, Miss Kathy. Hello, friend. How are you? So, so good to be with you all tonight. Uh, it's it's interesting. My husband was just asking me earlier. He wanted to mow the lawn and he said, how long until the sun sets? And I said, you have until 717. And it's funny. He's like, how did you know that? I'm like, because I've been looking at how long um, it's taking in the evening for the sun to set. And we are in uh, that time of year where it is getting dark earlier. If it is where you are, I know it certainly is where I am. And um, so anyway, it is so good to see all of you here. Here and so good to have you on the live popping on again if you cannot stay for all of this I will have it on replay for you to watch back and then I will try and upload it on a, on my YouTube channel it doesn't always happen that way um, but uh, that is the plan um, usually I start out with a question for all of you um, I'm not gonna do that tonight instead I'm gonna I'm, I wanted to think of something different to do and if you have a question for me I would love to answer that so I'm gonna take just a about five or six minutes here at the beginning of this session trying to get everybody uh, time to get on and get their journals and their Bibles and their pens and their highlighters and all of that good stuff um, as we dig into the Word of God here but if you have any questions for me I would love to answer that um, and we've just got a few minutes before people start hopping on that I could answer those for you so um, so shoot you know go go with any question that you have hello mama hello hello everyone hello miss Ann so good to see you friend so glad that you are joined in I love those faithful ones who are on here every single week it gives me such great joy like seriously you cannot know those reoccurring little things faces that I see every single week. I absolutely love that you guys make it a priority to hop on here. And it's like having uh, an extended family right here in my office uh, with me. So thank you so much. How are the bride and groom? That is a good question. Kathy asks, how are the bride and groom? They're doing really, really well. Of course, we know that California, large, large, uh, portions of California are on fire, and they still are, uh, so they are living in pretty um, challenging weather conditions. Uh, it's I think I talked to her a couple days ago when it was like 100 degrees still there, so fall does not feel, uh, it does not feel like it's fall to them right now, but they are doing really well. They're happy. He's full-time student, so he is uh, busy doing his thing in school, and she is busy doing her thing with YouTube and creating and writing and all of those good things so thank you for that question hello miss felicia it's so good to see you i'm trying to interact with people on the side and not get distracted i'm giving myself about five to six minutes probably three to four minutes now while we're waiting for everyone to hop on if you have any question for me i would love to answer it for you. I usually ask the question. Uh, I usually come with a question for the evening, but I just thought I'd throw it out. Do you have any uh, questions for me that I'd answer? Anything, uh, anything that you want to know, maybe about journaling, maybe about the Bible, maybe 
anything at all. Maybe it doesn't have to be anything related to that at all. Kathy just asked how the bride and groom were, and she was actually specifically referring to my daughter and her new husband. So, yes, they are very busy, Mom. Absolutely very busy doing stuff. So any questions that I can answer, I would be happy to do so. If not, I'm going to wait probably one more minute. I see other people hopping on, and I'd like to give um, ample time for everybody to key in. Uh, we've got a packed night, as we often do on Mondays. Um, I was looking back over YouTube, and I was discovering that my length of video, I'm, they're getting a little bit longer. The length is increasing in these videos, and so I want to keep it as... I want to be as, as as wise as I can with keeping this in a reasonable time frame. And so, um, but I did just want to wait uh, a little bit for people to be able to jump on. If there are no questions um, past that, I appreciate that question, Kathy. I'm always up for um, questions. If you ever at any time have a question that you want to ask, um, and uh, I don't see it on that side chat bar that I where I can see your names. Um, feel free to uh, message me. I am always down for speaking to you privately, and will help to get those questions answered uh, in a relatively timely manner. So we are going to dive in tonight. We are going to be in First Corinthians nine. First Corinthians nine, and. Um, it's interesting. Again, I think I have shared with you here in this uh, in this platform before. I certainly know that I have shared it in our journal nights um, many times. But um, uh, I typically do not plan well, well in advance what I'm going to speak on and or what we're going to even be studying. And uh, I have a, a pile of work that I've been doing for the last few months, studies that I am, am working on and um, that sort of thing. And so uh, today I just happened to pull this one out and thought this would be a great one for us to dive in together. Julie asks, what do I need for this session? Um, your Bible, journal, and a pen. That's really all you need. A pen and a journal to take notes and then your Bible if you have that handy. Um, uh, let's see, how do you decide what to talk about each Monday? Ah, it's funny because I was just answering that. So uh, typically what I will do is I will review anything that I've been studying that has really resonated with me. So right now, seriously, I know I show this almost every week, but I have this pile of things that I have been working on and studying uh, for the last several months. And I just kind of keep an ongoing list of the ones that I really, really resonated with and the studies that really popped out to me and scriptures that really spoke to me. And that's kind of what I decide. This morning, uh, I, I, honest to goodness, this is what I did. I pulled four of them out. There were four major uh, things that we could have talked about tonight, and it's I'm always very, very prayerful about what God would have me to do. Um, I was not getting a good sense between two different verses, so I messaged my friend and I said, I'm going to lay this on you. Which one should I do? And she chose this one. So you can thank her for having chose this one, but it's going to be a good one tonight. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be in chapter 9. Hello, Miss Janie. So good to see you. I'm so glad that you are here. I miss you. I was thinking about old Bible study days uh, a few days ago, and it is so good to see your little face pop up. I am so grateful that you are here. That warmed my heart. Um, again, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and um, this is something that uh, has been something that I've been studying maybe for about a week now, uh, a week or, or so. I One of my really good friends, Melissa, uh, who is not with us tonight, she normally is a faithful follower on our Monday night um, lives, but she had to go pick her mom up from the airport tonight. So Melissa, if you're watching this on playback, hello, hello, my friend, I love you. Um, she had sent me over uh, some powerful scriptures about two weeks ago and said, hey, you know, when I was praying for you, these are the things that came up in my prayer for you. And so, of course, I wanted to be diligent and write those down. And one of them was in 1 Corinthians. And it, it really was specifically about Paul, but I really have been kind of um, obsessed with Paul lately. Um, I want to start out by saying that if you have had the chance to watch Paul the Apostle, the movie, uh, it came out in theaters, limited theaters, you know, limited view theaters, um, maybe 
maybe two years ago. I think my daughter was in her first year at BSSM in Redding, California, the year that my husband and I saw it. It was right around Easter when it came out. It's called Paul the Apostle. Now, there are some other ones that are called Paul as well or um, have other names to it, but this one is called Paul the Apostle. I, I really believe that's what it is. Hello, Miss Renee. I'm so glad you made it. So good to see your face in here. Um, but we went to see Paul the Apostle, and it was phenomenal. Um, most of the, we went to one of those theaters where you have like recliner chairs, you know, and that's never really a good idea for me because it never fails that probably five or 10 minutes into the movie, I can start to feel my eyes get really heavy. And so for me, it's never a good good thing. But for this particular movie, I stayed engaged from start to finish. Now, of course, it's because I am a Bible lover and a Jesus lover. And so, of course, uh, having engaging material to watch is helpful. Um, but I remember being so impacted by that um, by that movie. I remember sitting in that recliner after the credits rolled and I just sat there. We were still sitting there after the credits rolled and everybody was exiting out of the theater. And I just remember looking over at my husband and saying, I want to be Paul. Like Paul was phenomenal. He was such a great character and he is a great character to study. And so um, what we find in the Old Testament is that 75% or more of the New Testament I'm sorry if I said Old Testament, I meant New Testament. Um, one of the fascinating things is that Paul wrote so much of the New Testament. And uh, we we get a really good glimpse into his life. And so with that, I kind of want to start, start with that as I'm talking about 1 Corinthians 9 tonight. Because I think it's important to have biblical characters um, that we take a really good look at in scripture and learn how they did life, right? How they behaved, what kind of personality they had, what kind of character traits that they had, how they prayed, how they served the Lord. I think this benefits us greatly. And Paul, of course, is like the master character to look at in the New Testament. And so uh, with that, I have been kind of really diving in and paying attention to some of the key elements of Paul's life and really what made him one of the greats in all of scripture. And so tonight I'm going to read two verses and um, I just want to kind of talk about them for a minute. And I want to talk at first kind of the way that I saw this when I first read it and the way that I am breaking it down. And then we're just going to go through the verse and kind of do a little Bible study together. So let's go. First uh, Corinthians 9, 26 and 27. I read from the NLT. I always preface by saying that. So if, if, if you don't resonate with it or if it's not reading the way that yours is reading, it's because that's the translation that I use for my primary Bible. Um, I want to actually go up, even though we're landing on verse 26 and 27, to give us some context, I want to go all the way up to verse 24. And um, I, I want to talk to you uh, a minute just about... Um, kind of set this up is he is in the beginning here he's talking about Paul giving up himself giving up his rights and he's talking about in the beginning he's talking to these believers and he's saying um he's saying things like you know as as a worker for Jesus Christ I have the um I have the opportunity to ask or to expect that you would pay me for the things that I do, right? Um, and he he talks about those things, and he says, you know, um, let let me go back to. Um, he said in verse 11, he says, since we have planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? So he's talking about, listen, I invested in you. I invest in you. I, I preach to you. I share with you the gospel. I, I you know, um, share with you what, what I know, my knowledge. And it would be wrong of me to not expect to get a harvest from the things that I plant. He goes on in verse uh, 12 and says, if you support others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even 
greater right to be supported. But we have never used this right, he says. We would rather put up with things than to be the obstacle to the good news of the of our faith in Jesus Christ. And so I did a little writing about this a couple days ago. You can actually go back and read that on our journaling page. But the verse that I want, so he's speaking to the church at Corinth, and he's saying in verse 24, he says this, and I'm going to start our night by, by reading through from 24 to 27. He says this, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. He's encouraging the church at Corinth. He's encouraging his brothers and sisters in Christ to run with great strength, to run with great integrity, to run the race that has been mapped out for them, the Christian race that you and I are a part of, to run it to win. He says this in verse 25. He says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So he's differentiating it between, and he's, he's kind of even, even um, proving it up against those who are athletes who discipline their physical body in order to gain a prize that will fade away. In other words, a prize that we can't take to heaven with us. Nothing that earns us you know, uh, any kind of benefit at all in the kingdom of heaven. He says, then how much more should we run for the eternal prize? In verse 26, he said, so I run with great purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. If you are circling in your Bible, there's a couple places already that I would circle is that would be the run to win and then purpose in every step and then shadow boxing, because those are some words that we're going to come back to. Uh, he says in verse 27, I discipline my body like an athlete. So now he's going back to parallel his, his disciplining himself as that, as that of an athlete that would do. He said, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should, what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So I want to take a look at it first, the way that I saw it, the way that I broke it down, the way that I would break much of scripture down when I come to it. So I really want to land specifically on verse 26 that says in, in the NLT that I just read, so run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. So I want you to read it in some of the different translations. Now, oftentimes what I will do is I will look it up in multiple translations, but what I've also gotten into the habit of doing. If there is a verse that I really like that says it's so much different in so many different variations of translations, I will go to biblehub.com. I will type in the address of the verse that I want to look up. So in this case, 1 Corinthians 9, 26. The very first thing that you're going to see is all of these translations, one right after the other. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll highlight the entire section that gives me a breakdown of each translation. I will copy and paste it into a uh, Word document, and then I'll print it. So that's actually what I did here is I went through every single translation that was available to me and I put down and I, and I just copied it and then I printed it off. The way, the reason that I like this so much is because there is such variation uh, between the languages in the different versions of scripture. And so I love to see them all laid out together so that I don't have to go back and reference. I can see them all there together in one page. And so I want to just kind of look through some of the different translations and what it says. For instance, the NIV, if that's a Bible that you have, the NIV, which is the New International Version, it says, therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. You might resonate a little bit more with that uh, if, if you like that translation as opposed to the NLT. Uh, look at it in the contemporary English version. It says this, I don't run without a goal and I don't box my, uh, I don't box by beating my fists in the air. I love this one. There's the good news translation. Let me read it to you in that, that one. It says, that is why I run straight to the finish line. That is why I am like a boxer who does not waste his punches. 
wow, we're going to talk about what it, what does it mean to um, to waste your punches, okay? Um, and we're going to talk about that one as well. Let's go to the international standard version. Listen to this one. It says, this is why I run with a clear mind, a clear goal in mind. This is why I fight, not like someone shadow boxing. Uh, and then look at in the Aramaic Bible in plain English. It says, I run therefore in this way, not as if something unknown. And so I contend not as one who fights the air. Um, and then the message version is the last one I want to read to you. And it's this one. And I absolutely love the message version for so many reasons, just like I love the passion translation, which is one I reference to most of all, I feel like, uh, besides my NLT here on the journaling page. But the message version says this, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. It goes on to say, I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it, and then missing out myself. That's verse 26 and 27, as, as that version is often, uh, often does, will take sections versus verses. Um, so we have got so much good in this little teeny uh, section of scripture. And... Um, there, there's just so much that is good. And I want to kind of just look at it in so many different variables tonight. Um, and I want to kind of show you how um, I have broken this down myself. When we read scripture, um, so much of it is, for me at least, it's finding the language that works for me. Uh, finding the language that speaks to me. I think that's why the Passion Translation speaks so well to me because it's very wordy and I love words. I'm a word nerd, um, self, self, uh, what is that? Um, uh, self-aware, I guess, that I am a word nerd. I love words and so it's very wordy and I love that. It's very poetic -y written. Um, and so I find a translation that really resonates to me and then I kind of do this. I pull it apart for one, but then I kind of translate it in my own words or in my own language. And so that's really what we're going to see as we break this down uh, tonight. We see in this scripture that Paul is speaking specifically about running a race, being an athlete in a race, in the Christian race. And he's talking about several things. First of all, he's talking about seeing a goal and then running with great purpose, intensity, and certainty. That's the first thing that we see. This goal of running after, running after, seeking after, chasing after Jesus. That is the goal that he's speaking of. He's speaking of Jesus being our ultimate prize, the one that we win in the end. But the thing is that we have a responsibility in that. And one of the things, if you've been with us in our journaling page for any amount of time, you know that I am big on practicality. I want to walk away from scripture having something that I can actually do or work on to become better. And this is one of those verses that I feel like you can definitely do because there's so much to pull away from it. Or I'm sorry, to take away from it. You and I have a responsibility, right? To run the race with great integrity. To run the, the race uh, that points to Jesus with our very lives. The one that says he is my ultimate prize and I am running this race for him and for no one else. We are to keep him in our full view all the time. I love Psalm 16, 8 in the English Standard Version and it says this, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Now, I don't know how many of you are visual learners. I am definitely a visual learner. If I can see right and left, if I can see pink or blue, if I can write something down from top to bottom, left to right, you know, I'm one of those visual learners. And so for me, this resonated so much when I saw this verse. I've set the Lord always before me. Think about that. Setting the Lord before me. Well, how do we set the Lord? I mean, he decides where he's moving. He decides where, we, where, where he's going. Yep, and that's just it. We run after him. We are always in the direction heading to where Jesus is. 
one of the things that I say all the time is in a crisis, in pain, in discouragement, in things in your life that you are going through that are hard, look for where Jesus is standing and then stand right next to him. That's one of the things that I'm, I love to even visualize is where is Jesus standing in this struggle? Because that's where I need to be standing. Not ahead of him, not, you know, not in totally, completely away from him, from him, not distanced from him at all. But where am I? Am I keeping him in front of me, in view, in my line of sight at all times? And that's what this verse is saying. The other thing he's talking about is that we are to cast the weight that ties us down. He's talking about running a race. He's talking about not just shadow boxing, right? So then he's talking about running as an athlete would do to train the body as it should go and, and as it should be. And he talks a little bit of, um, about this, this weight. We're going to see that in another verse. We're going we're gonna to wait to talk about that in just a minute. But one of the things that I want to say is, we, are we keeping fixated upon Jesus? We are to stay fixated upon Jesus. You know, in this season of crisis, I think it's really, really um, easy to find where the enemy is working and find the areas that would be um, that would be easy to condemn right now. It would be easy to find pain that is happening right now. It would be easy to find things that really upset you in this world right now. But what I know to be true is that when you and I diligently set the Lord always before us, then our view changes our mindset changes, our thought life changes, our perspective changes, everything changes. And so I would ask, what are we fixating on? If it not be Jesus, I think it's a really good question to ask ourselves. If it not be Jesus, then what is it? What is it that we're being distracted by that needs to be occupied by the vision of Jesus? So, um, Let's go on um, a little bit. He, he talks about this running and how we are training ourselves. Um, okay, can anybody, everybody see me? I see Kathy that says, oh no, am I the only one that lost? She's back, mom says. Okay, am I, are we good? Okay, I think we're good. Yes, I think I'm seeing messages come in, so I think we're good. We're talking about uh, another thing that there, he's talking about here is training ourselves, training ourselves. And I want to I want to talk about that a little bit. This disciplining ourselves, this training ourselves. We are keeping ourselves in good spiritual health. I go back to some of the early earlier videos that we did this year when the pandemic first started, and one of the things that I was constantly talking about is how important it was to keep spiritually fit in this time that how important it was to be in the word every single day, how important it was to stay in communion with the Father, how important it was to make sure that our atmospheres, our environments were clean. Uh, I, we, can, we can go back and I can reference some of the old, um, and I will after this, I will, I will reference some of the videos that we did earlier on, is about keeping atmospheres clean. What does that mean? We're going to talk about that for a minute. So we're going to talk about what it means to train ourselves, what it means to condition ourselves. Now, I'm not an athlete. I've never been an athlete. I've never been good at sports, not a day in my life. My husband would completely argue with you. He would tell you that I'm actually pretty good at tennis. I'm actually pretty good at golf. I'm pretty good at those independent one-person, one-on-one, uh, um, you know, athletic um, sports, but I do not, I'm not, I've never been one that's loved team sports. I was never one that loved basketball or baseball, softball, any of those kinds of things. I liked, I ran track one year, I think in school, um, but I really don't um, resonate very well with an athlete. But in talking about uh, this word training and disciplining his body like an athlete, training at what I can do. For some reason, I really resonated with that word training. And so, um, so it becomes 
so important for us to realize that we are in training that every obstacle that we face every hardship that we run into every difficult season of our life you and i have the opportunity to grow to be better to learn to gain knowledge to be the best version of ourselves that we can possibly be um i remember when um when we had we were going through a very difficult season in our life as a family and during that almost year time frame it was very very difficult for me on some days i would wake up with great enthusiasm and great expectations for how the day was going to go and i i would remind myself of who jesus was i would remind myself of who i was in christ and yet at the end of the day so many days i felt deflated um, we would get to the end of the day with no resolution, with no answers, um, and it was a difficult season for my family and I. Um, but one of the things that um, I remember coming out of that season was that we were so ridiculously and abundantly blessed in that season. Looking back, now we talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago, that so much of life, especially as you get older, is looking in the rearview mirror, right? So a lot of what we do as we get older is we look back on situations, we look back on seasons of our life and go, yes, I can see the hand of God in all of that. But how many of you know that as you're going through it, it's sometimes difficult to see the hand of God. It's sometimes difficult to see the forest for the trees when you're in the thick of things, right? And so um, we were kind of in the thick of things and, and we were just being ridiculously blessed. Now, I wish I had time to go into the story with you, but like day after day after day, we would see the hand of God, the physical hand of God on our life by people that blessed us, by people that loved us, by people that gave us monetary gifts and didn't even know we were in need, didn't even know what we were sacrificing. Um, we had people like do some crazy above norm, just blessed our socks off. And we, we, for almost a year, God really sustained us. And we saw provision like we have never seen in our life. And I remember coming out of that season and I remember just weeping to my mom one day and saying, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand. Like, why? Why? How did this happen? Why did this happen? Like, how come people are just so good? Like, I didn't think about this before, like when I've heard of people losing jobs or when I've heard of people in horrible seasons, sometimes my, you know, just being honest, sometimes my, my, um, the first thing that comes to my mind often is not to do the things that other, that I've seen others do, but my gosh, I was like, I don't understand. We live in such, um, a blessed society. Like such a blessed community is what I remember telling my mom. And I said, why are people doing this? And she said, Wendy, it's because you've been faithful. And I remember for a minute thinking like, I have? <laughs> like, I, I guess I knew that I was faithful. I guess I knew that I loved Jesus. I guess I knew that I was in his word every day. But to hear someone say that, it changed the game for me. And I remember coming home and saying, God's blessing because we've stayed with him. God's blessing us because we've not left. He's, he's blessing in multiple ways because we've decided that we are going to take the opportunity to train ourselves to be the best that we can be so that when the crisis is over, when the hardship is over, when the hard stuff is done, we can be better people. And so I think that's really what Paul is talking about here. He's saying, you know, we need to get into the habit of looking at every si single situation that is happening and look at it as if we were running a race. How are we training for this race? How are we using the quiet moments of our days? How are we using the idle moments of our life? How are we using the challenging seasons of our life to get better, to get spiritually healthy, 
to be the best version of ourselves that we can be so that when we finish that race, we can hear the words of Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. And so I have with you several things that I want to share to you tonight about uh, the first thing is something that I would ask you just to take notes on. If you're taking notes, this is the time you'd pull out your journal if you haven't done so already. We are to run with, and I'm going to give you a list of things that I feel like we are to run with. Things that, characteristic traits that we ought to have when we are considering running our race with Jesus. The first thing is consistency consistency. Now, there is no doubt that I chose this one to be the number one thing that I would talk about. Consistency. My commentary says this. It says that there are people that, quote, like to be pious in intervals. Now, the word pious really means committed or dedicated, uh, godly, holy, um, but but it, it, it captures what I think that I wanted to say and never knew how to articulate that we see people who like to be pious or like to be dedicated or like to be committed to Jesus in intervals. And that's the danger that we live in is this, the fact that we can't stay consistent with much of anything. So much of our days, so much of our time is consumed with what's the latest and greatest thing? What's my schedule like? What do I need to do? What's on the agenda? Where do I need to go? What do I need to be involved in? Where do my kids need to be? There's so much vying for our attention that we often get, um, we often see the tendency to push back on our spiritual life. We push back on the things that actually mean the very most in our lives, the things that are the most important. So we see this, this interval that we go through, right? And I've seen it all throughout my adult life and looking at other Christians and other, other the, the way other people do it. Um, I've seen it in my ministry life. I've been leading, um, I've been in ministry for, oh my goodness, 16 years of my life. And of those 16 years, seven of them were in a church setting. And I would see this in the church setting for sure. But the last probably uh, 10 years of my life have have been teaching Bible studies, doing events, um, uh, you know, teaching like this on a, in, in a setting like on a, on a Zoom class or online, um, being involved with women in all different varying degrees. And what the number one thing that I see is inconsistency, where we'll see them like get really excited for a season of time, like where they're like, they buy the new Bible, they buy the new journal, they buy all the pens and the highlighters, they have every flag, uh, page flag known to mankind, every sticky note, every, you know, all the paper, all the pretty stuff. And they're really excited. And it's authentic. Like they're really thrilled about getting in the word of God. They're really thrilled about getting serious with their Jesus. And then somewhere in the, in the middle of all of that, it gets weird. Like they start, uh, you know, maybe it's like they go through a crisis of some sort, or maybe they have a setback in a relationship, or maybe there's just something that they don't understand. Uh, I, I, I find this is to be true a lot. A lot of times we look into scripture and say, man, I really wish I could get it like she does. I really wish that I could read and understand the way she does. I wish that the Lord spoke to me the way they do them. And so we see that we get frustrated. And, and so consistency is the main important ingredient in our life. It's the main important ingredient in our running the race and training ourselves and being disciplined in our race with Jesus is this consistency. And so I always say, I don't care if it's like an hour long Bible study or if it's a six hour long Bible study or if it's a five minute, man, all I have time today is write this Bible verse on a sticky note. Get something in and then be, be consistent. I think the prayer that you and I should be praying more radically than almost any other prayer in our life is, Lord, do not let me live in an inconsistent pattern when I'm seeking after you. Help me to be consistent. I want to come to you every single day, and I don't want to miss a beat. I want to stay with you. No matter what happens, no matter what comes my way, no matter what someone says, no matter how busy I get, it's consistency, and I'm staying with you. The second thing is concentration. 
concentration. I think that's so important when you're talking about running the race and training ourselves to be an athlete is concentration. Having this fixated vision that goes, you know what, I am concentrating on this no matter how no matter what that means. Sometimes for me, it's meant getting alone in my car on my lunch hour and going to a park and just sitting there and like concentrating, giving the Lord my full and undivided attention. Sometimes it's getting up earlier in the morning and sitting just with a hot cup of coffee and some worship music. Sometimes it's being at the end of my day and just needing to go and like sit in the tub and just unwinding and then just spending that time with Jesus. But it's this concentration. It's this getting my focus more fixated on what is important in my life. What are what are the, the key elements that are important in my life and concentrating on those things. The next thing I would say would be confidence. Confidence. You, you, we have to maintain confidence if we are training ourselves to be an athlete who runs to Jesus. We have to be confident. I am going with Jesus. I cannot fail. That's the attitude that we have to have. This takes fixed vision. I love this part in my commentary. It says, it uses these words, courage and fortitude. That with this confidence that you and I have to have courage and fortitude. The word fortitude is an interesting word. It's not one that we use on a regular basis. The word fortitude actually means the mental and emotional strength in facing difficulties, adversity, danger, or temptation courageously. Let me read that again. The word fortitude. So it's talking about in my commentary that we need to maintain courage and fortitude when we are running the race for Jesus. And it means the mental and emotional strength in facing difficulties, adversity, danger, or temptation, and to do it with courage. I love that. There is danger, I will say, in being overconfident. There's danger in being overconfident. And what do I mean by that? We need a confidence. You and I need this confidence that prompts us to exertion, not confidence that will kill our effort. So, so let me explain that. We need confidence that prompts us to action. We need confidence that gives us hope that today we can wake up and we can believe that Jesus has got this, that he's in full control, that he still has the whole world in the palm of his hands, and that as long as I am keeping him in my line of vision, I am safe. But there is this other part that we need to look into, and that's to make sure that confidence doesn't kill our effort which means our effort needs to be relying on Jesus. Our effort needs to be realizing that our help comes from the Lord. And so sometimes we can get overconfident. I've been accused, or at least I have accused myself, of being overconfident in times in my life. And during those seasons of time where I was overconfident, I remember feeling like I didn't have a really good, solid relationship with Jesus at that time. I was overconfident. I was looking at myself. I was, I was looking more inwardly what I could do, what I could, what, what my abilities were. And really, we need to maintain this God confidence that says, God, I want you to prompt me to action, but I don't want it to kill my effort. At the end of the day, it's about Jesus. It's not about anything I do. It's not about anything you do, because without him, we have nothing. Moses said it in the Old Testament in Exodus. He says it. The man, the man himself, uh, Moses, says, God, I want you to move. I want you to do these things. I want you to lead us. But listen, you got to know that if you don't move, we don't go. And that's the kind of confidence that we have to have. I have confidence in the fact that when you go, we go. And when you say to stay, we stay. But if you don't move, we stay right where we're at because we don't want to be one step in front of you. We want to be looking at you. We want to be setting you in front of us at all times. The next thing I think that we need to run with is endurance. Endurance. You and I uh, have to endure to the end. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but that is a huge word. We have to uh, endure. Yes, Julie said like a, like a musician, discipline to practice. Yes, and it takes hard work and discipline, Mom said, a priority. That's just it. It's a priority. It has to become a, a priority. I use this, this phrase a lot. It's a non-negotiable. I've used that phrase for a long time. For me, study in the morning, it's a non-negotiable. 
it's, it's just like I don't wake up and go, hmm, I wonder if I'm going to have some quiet time today. It is part of the routine that I have built into my life. It's part of the routine that has placed me in a, in a position where I am conditioning myself to, like an athlete would, to run the race that Jesus has for me. Um, so we have to have endurance. We have to endure to the end. This is not one of those things where we can go, you know what, um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go as far as I can and that'll be good enough. One of the things that I'm constantly, uh, I feel like I'm famous for saying, not, I'm not famous by any means, but I'm, I'm noted for having said this, um, is that, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, you, you will hear people say, well, Jesus will meet us right where we are. He'll meet me in my mess. He meets me in my trouble. He meets me in my fear. He meets me in my anxiety. And that would be absolutely true. It would be a true statement. I was found in a mess. I was found in a mess when I was, a, when I was little and when I was saved. And I was found in a mess 20 years later when I was still making a mess of my life. He found me in my mess and he pulled me out of that. Just like if you are a Christian and you are saved by grace, you were pulled out of a mess, you were rescued, and you were brought to safety. But the fact of the matter is, he meets you where you are. He's just not comfortable to leave you there. He's not okay to leave you there. He wants to take you somewhere. And so that is why he is saying, now is the time. Train your body like an athlete. Do what you need to do to get yourself in good spiritual health. You know, I think about that all oftentimes. I had a pastor once say a long time ago, um, said in a sermon once, and it really resonated with me. He said, you're either coming out of something, you're in something, or you're getting ready to go into something. You're in one of those three spots. You're either just getting out of the flow of something terrible or not so great. You're either in something that's a season of just not really something great, or you're getting ready to go into something of the unknown that's not going to be real great. And you and I have to maintain, uh, we have to take this opportunity to get strengthened, to be trained, to be disciplined, to put those habits in our life that will help us later on down the road. So that when we need to be strengthened, we already have it. We're not, we're not, we're not being, we're being proactive. We're not being reactionary, right? The next thing I think that we need to do is have patience. I think that running the race takes patience. We are to be, um, we, we are to have patience. I think, about, I think about these marathons that my dad used to run. When I was a little girl, he ran several Detroit ma uh, free press marathons. And I remember, even as a little girl, I was thinking about when, that when I was thinking about running. Uh, and I've never been a runner, although I've, I have thought about it and I have wanted to start many, many, many times. And I have the goal to do that this fall. Um, but when I was a little girl, I remember watching him and being very impressed with the runners because there's 26 miles that they're running in a marathon, right? And I used to think, wow, like, you know, we would start out, we would see them where they would start, um, you know, in, you know, in Detroit, we would watch them as they would go across the start line and then we would drive our car like we would go you know maybe to get something to eat maybe some something to drink or whatever a snack and then we would go to um i think it was belle isle where they actually would end up crossing the finish line several hours later and i mean it'd be like two three four hours later right and um, i remember thinking about this as a, as a little kid actually and i distinctly remember watching some of them take off at the starting point and thinking well they didn't start out really fast like they should have run a little faster if they wanted to win you know because in my mind as a little girl i was thinking that it was the you know it was to win right i thought that they needed to go fast in order to to win and so my thought was like hurry up guys go a little faster but, but what I didn't know and what the truth really is, is that some people who run the fastest at first actually run the slowest in the last. Let me say that again. Some people run the fastest at first, but they're the slowest ones in the end. So that's why I think it's important to watch what you're getting yourself into head first in the beginning. 
you know, I think that's why we see this lack of consistency across the board with so many people is in so much enthusiasm and this light that ends up dying out is because we run with great intensity. We run with great integrity. We run with great purpose and great intention in the beginning, but we start out running. We hit the ground running. And what do I mean by that? Like we read our Bibles faithfully. We get into a prayer group. We join every Bible study known to mankind. We join our church. We get in, you know, we get involved in ministry of some sort. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves in this place of burnout because we started running so fast that there's no possible way that we could endure or that we could sustain for a long period of time. And this isn't a race to the finish line. This isn't a race. This is an independent race. This is an independent journey that you are on with Jesus. And, and that's why I'm, I'm a big one on like, don't take big, huge chunks of the Bible and read them and think that it's all about getting as much content as you possibly can. I had a woman message me the other day and she's like, so let me understand this correctly. You actually only study a couple verses in a day. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I guess she must have heard me say that, or maybe I referenced that on our journaling page or something. And I said, yeah, actually, that's what I mean. Now, what I mean is, even further breaking that down is that I I get in the Word of God and I read to, I read the context right so like for chapter nine for these two verses I'm not just going to necessarily pull these two verses out of thin air and just study those I'm going to read for context so I might go all the way back to nine I might go all the way back to eight or seven chapters to look at what the context is but I only study two verses. And one or two verses. And I, I got to tell you that the things that come from just narrowing my focus, starting out slow and asking God to show up in my quiet time has been the richest, most satisfying moments of my entire life. And so don't think that it's about quantity. It's about quality. Don't, don't get into this process where you lack patience for what it is that God would reveal to you. Um, it, you know, it's taken me a long time to get to the place where I fi finally feel like I hear God every time I open his word. And that was not always my, always the case. And for those of you who are new, I just, I'll share my story with you very quickly is that I was in ministry for seven years. I worked on staff at a church for seven and a half years, and it was my life. I loved every second of it. I loved being involved with the people. I loved helping people to take their next step with Christ. I loved serving um, alongside of the best teams that I I, I had never known that there were such amazing people. Um, I loved the work I did, but I was empty. I was really, really empty because at the end of the day, I was leading on empty. I was leading teams without being spiritually fit. And I remember there was one particular day when a woman came into my office, a good friend of mine at the time, who was a volunteer on my office staff. And she came in and she said something to me that literally changed the trajectory of my life, like totally changed my life. Um, she came in and we were having a discussion about being busy and I was, we were in a really, really busy season. And I, I remember she looked at me and she said, Wendy, I see you always at the church. I see you always doing the work. I see you always involved in this, that, and the other thing. And I wasn't usually just involved in it. I was probably spearheading it. Like I was probably leading it because very few were actually stepping up you know, to, to lead at that point. And so I was probably leading it. And I remember um, her saying to me, when, like, just tell me, when do you have time to do your quiet time with Jesus? And I remember having to excuse myself, go to the bathroom, and I literally felt sick. And I felt sad. And I felt a lot of shame. I felt guilt. Because here I was leading scores of people week after week after week. I was leading some of the largest teams in that church. Like one of the teams that I serve, that, that I helped to lead and serve in, there was like 130 people in that team. And here 
I had no good answer to give back to her as to when I had my quiet time with Jesus. I couldn't answer that. And so I remember excusing myself, not fully engaging with that question again. I don't think I ever gave her a full answer. And by the week end, I, was, I had put in my two week resignation. I knew that I could no longer lead the people that I was leading and not be reading scripture and not be praying regularly. I felt like I was a phony. I felt like I was a fraud. I felt like I had failed God. I felt like I had failed myself. And I felt like I had failed my church and my family. And so when I left that job, I made the decision a couple months later because I had to get myself into a good headspace because I was really having a hard time after I left that job because it was my identity. It was who I was. I remember leaving that job and a couple months later getting really serious about my walk with Jesus. And I said, something has got to change. And so I remember I bought a Bible. I got myself a journal, a pen. I was ready. I sat down in front of the, or I sat down on my kitchen table and I opened up my Bible. And I just literally remember sitting there reading. And I don't know what I was reading. I can't tell you where I started, but I know that I didn't understand it. And I got very frustrated. And so I closed my Bible. And I did that for a couple of weeks before I really realized that what I was doing is I was check marking something off of a list of things that I felt like I needed to do. And I needed God to change my heart. And so my prayer began to be, God, give me a passion for your word. Give me a passion for your word. And I don't know where that came from. It's only Holy Spirit driven that I can look back and say that that was where it came from. But I remember thinking, God, I, I want the ministry. Like I want whatever it is called you is that you've called me to do. At that point, I wanted to write a book. I had devotional ideas swirling in my head. There were a bunch of things that I wanted to do. And God, I, I was like, God, I am ready for whatever you have. And as ready as I was, or I thought I was, I wasn't ready at all because there was a journey that he needed to take me on. There was a time where he had to take me to prepare me, to train me, to, um, to, to get me to a point where I was weak enough to admit that I needed his help and that um, I couldn't do this alone. And so it was, give me a passion for your word. Every single day I prayed that prayer. And it was every day for about a year before I could finally find myself at, in scripture, understanding one or two lines. And, um, it, you know, it was this process. And for me, it's been having patience in this process while God molds me, shapes me, develops me, gets me to the right place that I need to be so that he can use me. And I'm seeing that happen in my life. But it's only through looking back in the rearview mirror. God, give me a passion for your word. It took patience. It took diligence. But every single day for me, it's a non-negotiable. And it has to be for you too. It has to be. And I hope that it would be. So patience is the thing that I had said before. And then pa passion was with that as well. Um, I want to note something with passion. Um, because again, you know, we, I, I have said that that was my big prayer is God, give me a passion for your word. And I want to note this. Um, and I want to, I, I, I need to pause really quick. <laughs> my dog is trying to get in and Hey, we're live. This is like real life. So my dog was trying to get in and she was actually clawing. Yep. See, whoop, there she is. And she's going to join us for the rest of the live. So, um, but I want to note that this, when I say about passion, I believe that it is lack of passion or it's indifference that kills the Christian life. You know, many think that, that entering into the race is good enough, that entering into the race is enough. And so they, don't experience the fullness that Christ died for them to have because for them, it's a one and done situation, but it's this indifference. It's this, it's this idleness that gets us in the most, keeps us in the most dangerous spot because that's where the enemy starts to creep in and go, did he really say that? Did God really mean that when he said that? I don't think he did. And so you see these doubts start to be, be creeping, uh, um, start creeping in my mind. And so we have to have passion. And it is the thing that we have to constantly 
constantly be praying for is, God, give me a passion for this. If you find yourself today in an honest place to say, you know what, I want to love the Bible. I want to know scripture. I want to be more strong in my faith. I want to understand what it is that I'm reading. But golly, I don't even know if I love to do it. I just do it right now because it's something that I know that I have to do. If that would be you, I mean, I would encourage you to start praying, God, give me a passion for your word. Listen, it is the one prayer. It is not, not the one, not the only one. There's many, but that is a prayer that I believe he just loves to answer because it aligns with what he wants for your life. And so you say, God, give me a passion for your word. I don't want to be indifferent anymore. I don't want to be idle anymore. I don't want to be in a place where I am, I am doing nothing because it is in that complacent place that the enemy starts to attack and tell me, did God really say that? And that's not, that's not a good place to be. Another thing that I would say is this word striving, striving. Now I know I'm going to get some pushback on this. Maybe I will, maybe I won't, but I, I feel especially like in my daughter's generation, we might get some pushback on this word. But I think that you and I have this obligation as a Christ follower, an obligation as the Jesus people to strive, to strive hard to run the race with integrity, to run the race with purpose, and to run the race with dedication and to strive. I say it with little caution, like I said, because I know that there is this tendency to say that Jesus doesn't want us striving, that this isn't about striving to be better or striving to look good or striving to master some skill. That's not what I'm talking about. But here is this, here is what the word means. There is this Greek word for, uh, for, for the word striving that is, uh, and I'm not going to say it right, so I'm going to spell it, is A-G-O-N-I-Z-E-S-T-H-E. Agonizeth, anyway, A-G-O-N-I. Z-E-S-T-H-E. And when you look at that word, you can realize that out of that root word is this word agonize. So it means to agonize or to struggle. And uh, it's kind of like in Luke 13, 24, when Jesus talks about entering into the narrow gate. There is this striving that takes place. There is this agonizing. There is this struggle that takes place when we are entering into the narrow gate. Why? Because it's not popular. It's, it's not easy. It's not convenient. There are all kinds of things that make it unpleasant. So I think, but I think that there is this, there's this element that we have to understand in this word striving that Jesus wants us to know and that Paul is trying to communicate to us about is this striving after Jesus, this, this deciding, this making a decision that I know this road is going to be hard. I know some of the decisions that I'm going to make are going to be unpopular. I know I may lose friends because I'm chasing after Jesus because people aren't going to, they're not going to know what to do with me. It's not going to make sense, right? Um, I know that there is some work that needs to happen, but in order to go through the narrow gate, as Jesus puts it, I must strive. I must give, I must put forth this agonizing effort this daily pursuit, this struggle. Paul would not have us to run for enjoyment or leisure, but according to verse 24, he tells us in verse 24 of chapter 9, run to win. Run to win. Like there's no choice. Like I have to win. I have to win the prize, which is Jesus. So we run to win. This could mean using the utmost effort. This could mean using our utmost effort, and that would include striving. The next thing I would say is obedience, just obedience. I think we could probably put a period to that, just obedience, to know what it is that he's called us to do and do that, to know when it, he's told us to keep our mouths shut and do that, to know when to, um, you know, when, when to hear those promptings from the Holy Spirit and then be led by the Holy Spirit to do those things. So obedience. The next thing I would say would be watchfulness. Watchfulness. I think it's really important for us when we're talking about running the race for Jesus is to be watchful. 
what's around me, who's looking, who's paying attention. We're going to talk about that in a minute, in a minute, but who is watching me and then who do I need to watch out for? Because as soon as we get determined to run this race with great integrity, great fervor, great passion, with obedience, I can guarantee there are going to be obstacles in our path because the enemy knows who we belong to and he's going to try everything he can to get us off of course. And then the last thing that I would say on this section would be expectation of winning the prize. We need to run with expectation of being the one who would win the prize. So consistency, concentration, confidence, endurance, patience, passion, striving, obedience, watchfulness, and expectation. Think about the words that they use that, that are used in the NIV for this particular scripture in verse 26. In the NIV, it says this, I do not like fighting a boxer beating the air. I do not, f I'm sorry, I think I said that wrong. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. It's, it's interesting that, that this word, this, 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 this beating the air is just a very interesting metaphor, I think, for missing the mark. Missing the mark. We're beating the air. Like, like, like when you watch a boxing match, right? And they're just swinging and they're swinging at nothing because the opponent is dodging, right? We have an opponent that we are up against who is skillful at maneuvering. He's skillful at dodging our blows, right? And so it's saying, do not fight like a boxer who's beating the air, one who's missing the mark or missing the blow. It would mean... It would mean that we are misusing our energy and we're spending our strength, not on the enemy, but on empty air. You know, it's one thing for us to go in in fighting the enemy with great strength and determination. And let me give you an example of this. I was sick, really, really sick a few years ago. I was really sick. I was in and out of the hospital. Um, oh gosh, by I think by April, I was in and out of the hospital in stays in the hospital three different times in 2018. I was very sick. And um, I remember I had just gotten to the point where I'm like, enough is enough. Like I was putting ministry on hold and I was, I was just, just stressed to the max. My husband was out of work at that current time and um, there was just all kinds of really horrible stressors that I felt like I was undertaking at that time in my life and I had finally gotten to the point where I'm like enough is enough enemy you do not win and I am taking you down and I went to war one night I woke up in the middle of the night and if anybody were to have seen me they might have thought I was crazy but I was warring and contending for my life I was remember walking up and down the hallway going enemy you don't have any place in this body of mine. You are not welcome in this home of mine. And in the name of Jesus, you have to go. And I just remember repeating that over and over again. I wasn't missing the mark. I was hitting him right between the eyes. See the difference that he's saying, you don't fight like a boxer who's beating the air. You determine where is he? Where are the places that he is trying to attack me and my life and my family and my health and whatever situation that you're fighting, come on, at, I'm, it's war, right? And you begin to fight the real enemy. And that's the key, the real enemy. How many of us waste so much time? We expend so much energy beating the air. There is a real enemy. And yet we waste our time. We, we exhaust our strength in misaligned efforts. In fact, there are real enemies that we are up against in our Christian journey. There are. There's the world, there's the flesh, and there's the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. We are contending against an enemy who basically adapts his attacks to meet our individual cases. Think about that. He adapts his mode of operation based on what it is that we're going through at that particular time. And so you and I are contending against a real enemy whose, whose target is always 
to kill, steal, and destroy, but he's going to do it in different ways every single time. Sometimes he uses people. Sometimes he uses that really great relationship where something is said and you can't forgive. Sometimes he uses a political debate to fuel you into negativity. And he says, huh, I got her right where I want her. His goal is always to kill, steal, and destroy, to injure or to kill us. And if he can't do that, well, then he'll take away everything that puts us in a place of confidence. And then if he can't do that, then he's going to try to destroy us with people and things and stuff. We have a real enemy. And he is out to, seek, to, to, to steal, kill, and destroy. What we need to be aware of is that the Christian life is this daily movement forward where we should be always progressing forward, always striving after the goal. We do need to be aware of the stumbling blocks, the things that prevent us from growing. I was thinking about that when I was thinking about these as, as Hebrews 12, 11 calls them weights, that they weigh us down, that they that they weigh us down, that they are weights, that they are obstacles in our path, they are stumbling blocks. The Israelites traveled around the same mountain for 40 years. And believe it or not, I have witnessed this spiritual interruption or this declination of spirituality in people for the very same thing, that they keep traveling around the same mountain. They, they keep getting stuck about the same stuff. They keep worrying about the same things that they have no control over. They keep putting themselves in a place where they take one step forward and four steps back. And we have got to get better than that. We've got to be better than that. Paul says something interesting in verse 27. As a preacher, he realized that there was this easy trap that he could fall into. That there was this easy trap easy trap that he could fall into. And, and it's the same for, I think, for all of us. He finishes up verse 27 and he says, I myself might be disqualified. The greatest fear of his life is that after he preached the good news to other people, that after he witnessed to people, that after he shared the message about loving Jesus, after he put a Facebook post out that said, hey, come to church with me Sunday at 10 o'clock, you'll love it. That somehow after all of that, he himself became disqualified because he himself didn't stay up on the work that needed to be done in his own life to keep himself in a good spiritually fit place. I would say that's the greatest fear of my life. I do not want to disappoint the Lord. So I question myself that at the end of it all, at the end of it all, am I doing what I need to do to keep myself spiritually fit? I have this little teeny um, post-it note that I leave beside my desk and I look at it every day. I've had it on there for a little while now and I want to read it to you because it's something that I got. Some of it's my own words, some of it's in my commentary that I read, but it's questions that I have to put before myself every single day and I think they're helpful um, what, some of these that are very, very helpful for all of us, not just those who preach the gospel, but because we're all preachers of the gospel, right? We're all examples of Jesus Christ. We all have the opportunity to teach and make disciples of all nations. And so this, these are things that all of us can keep aware of. But this is something that I look at every day. I, says, I say this because, and I write next to it, I am Paul, because that is who I want to be like, right? I, I want to be Paul. And so I wrote, I am Paul. And I said this. Um, that I must have evidence day by day of following Jesus. Do I have evidence every day that I am following Jesus? I must be least disposed to live on past experiences. I have to make new ones. So the questions to ever put me before me are, am I a Christian today? Now, am I a Christian? Am I following Christ? You know, the word Christian means little Christ. Am I a little Christ? Am I living as a Christian should now? Not last week, not when I was saved 20 some years ago, now. 
Am I displaying Jesus to others? Am I giving myself to daily, constant, growing evidence that I am actuated by the principles of the gospel and that the gospel is the subject and my life and my holiest desire? I think it's questions that we have to ask ourselves all the time. Am I a Christian today? I'm not, I'm not saying that I go to church. I'm not saying that I read the Bible. I'm not saying that I pray. Do I look to Jesus every day? Am I a little Christ? Do I know him? Am I a Christian today? Am I behaving the way that Jesus would? Am I answering the way that he would answer? Jesus said, I only did what I saw the Father do. I only say what I hear the Father say. So it becomes for you and I that we must live a life filtered through that lens. Am I a Christian now? Is what I'm talking about, is what I'm thinking about, is what I am communicating, is what I am keeping before me every single day about Jesus and nothing else? Because it matters. I don't want to be an Israelite walking around that same mountain over and over and over again, saying, well, God will meet me in my mess. And someone else saying, yeah, he met you in your mess 40 years ago, but you were too stubborn and too blind to see that he didn't want to leave you there. And so he carried on. And here you are. I don't want that about myself. I think there's this one reoccurring thing that I hear from people, women, all the time is I want to know my salvation is secure. It is one of the things that we used to see routinely in the church that I worked at. We would have these little communication cards, and we would have these little teeny boxes that they could check on. One would say, I gave my life to Christ. One would say, I committed my life to Christ, or I recommitted my life to Christ. I cannot tell you, because I looked at those cards every single week. I filtered out the prayer requests on those cards every single week. And every single week, I would have the same people put, I committed my life to Christ. Why? Because they needed to understand. They needed to know that their salvation was secure. I had a woman message me just last week. I need to know that Jesus is proud of me. That's what she said to me. Like, I need to know that I am doing enough. I think that's the one question that I get asked all the time is, how do I know my salvation is secure? I don't want to disappoint the Lord. I think what they're saying is that I don't want to be disqualified. I don't want to get this far along in my walk and hear that I was disqualified because of something that I did. And look and listen, disqualification can happen easy. It can happen really easy if we don't stay disciplined in our following Jesus, in our putting him in front of us, in us daily seeking his face in us getting in his word, not to understand, but for revelation of who he is, of relationship, of developing this communion with Jesus. What made Paul victorious and what makes you and I victorious is that we become temperate in all of these things. It's an interesting word that I keep coming up in my quiet time over and over again, that we must be temperate. What does that mean? It means that uh, this means moderate or self-restrained or not extreme in opinion, not excessive. And so I just wrote down some of the things that I think about when, when, when keeping uh, in good temperament. It would be good in our thoughts and our emotions and our words and our ways in our joys, and our sorrows, and our actions, and our activities, in our personal indulgences, in our ambitions. These are the things that we must be cautious of keeping under the Lordship of Jesus, of saying, you know what, I'm going to run with great integrity the race that he's marked out for me. I'm going to run with Jesus because I don't want to be disqualified. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. And I kind of want to wrap two things up for you tonight. The first thing is Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, 
Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. I love that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us strip off the weight that slows us down and let's run the race that he's mapped out for us. My commentary about that part, about the crowd being a, being a crowd of witnesses, my commentary says, in no part of the course am I out of view of the judge and of a great concourse of spectators. Think about that. Never are we out of view from the great judge or a concourse of spectators. Think about who the spectators are in your life, the ones who are watching your race because they're watching. I'm watching other people's races. I'm watching not, not to compare myself or contrast myself with them, but I'm looking at inspiration. I'm looking at the ones that I can look up to, the ones that do it right, the ones that run with great integrity, the ones who are kind, the ones who are, who are passionate, the ones who stay fixated upon Jesus. Think about the ones who are watching us. Just think about that for a moment. The great judge, King Jesus. That's one of the people, that's one that's watching us, right? The ungodly, they're watching us. I would say they're watching Christians now more than ever because why? They're looking for some hope. I would think unchristians or non-Christians are looking to us more than ever before. What do they see? How do they see? What are they interpreting by looking at my life and by your life? Fellow Christians, they're watching us. If you think you're not, they're not, you're wrong. They are. I'm a fellow Christian and I'm watching. I'm paying attention. I'm looking to see where Jesus is because I want to go stand where he's standing. Angels. Angels are keeping track of us. They're watching us. I heard a pastor once say that, pay attention to what you talk about when you're in groups of people. He said, if you want to invite the angelic into a place, like say there's a, say you routinely go to lunch with friends and there's this one place that you love to go to, but you just, you know that they need, they need Jesus in, in the worst way. You know that the atmosphere isn't one that is a godly atmosphere. And so you just want to infuse more Jesus into that place. He said, here's what you do. He said, you know, angels are attracted to what your viewpoint is of God. And so if you want to attract them into the places that God is not in, go into those places and just start talking about God. Just start talking about the testimony of the Lord. In other words, go in with a group of your friends and just start talking about Jesus moments. Start talking about what, what, what ways that you've seen God work because the angels are paying attention. And that attracts the angelic presence into that place. That's a beautiful thing. But they're watching. Who else is watching? I just wrote a couple more down that I thought of. Victors of the past, people that have had victory in the past. I think about all of the people who've prayed for me, who've now passed, they're watching. They're watching to see their prayers be um, unfolded in my life. And then failures of the past, they're watching too. People that have failed, people that have gone down the wrong path are watching and they're going, you know what, don't do it the way I did it. You're better than that. And Jesus loves you. So those are just some of the, the things that I thought about when I thought about that huge crowd of witnesses that are watching us. One of the hardest things to read for me in all of scripture is 2 Peter 2, 20 through 21. And it says this. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they're worse off than they were before. 
it would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness, righteousness than to know it and then reject the command that they were given to live a holy life. That's the hardest scripture for me to read in almost all of the Bible. What is it saying? It's saying that it would be better off that if you decide that you're going to follow Jesus and you slip back into sin and you get yourself down a negative pathway again, it would be better for you to have not known at all than to try and return. Because it's hard. That's why he calls it a narrow gate. He'd call it a wide, easy gate if everybody, if it was just easy for everybody to enter in. He called a wide gate, but it's not, it's a narrow gate. And few enter it. Few will endure to the end. I've had this vision swirling in my mind for months now, since the pandemic started. And it's this vision of a remnant being raised up. In scripture, all throughout, especially the Old Testament, they talk about a remnant and how a remnant, which is just a small few, are the ones that will be saved. And you and I can't afford to not be part of that remnant that God is raising up out of the ashes because he is raising up out of the ashes. We are not just survivors. We are conquerors and victory is ours in Jesus' name. And we can't afford any kind of setback. We have to run our race to win. We have to run our race with integrity, with obedience, with passion, with consistency, with confidence, striving, with great amounts of effort. It's why self-examination is so important. I have a couple verses that I want to give to you in regard to um, self-examination. It's Lamentations 3.40, Galatians 6.4, and 2 Corinthians 13.5. And I want to tell you this, self-examination is great. It's always good to look inward and find out places that we need to grow and learn and be strengthened. But it's never for the sake of shaming. Jesus is crazy, madly in love with you. And I think you need to hear that tonight. I think you need to hear that if you have walked away if you have misused your strength, if you have gotten complacent, if you're afraid that you've messed up, he's telling you tonight, I love you and it's time to come home. And I think someone needs to hear that. I know where you've been. I know where you are. If that's the place that you're at, I know where you're at. I've been there, but I had to recall to my memory all of the promises of God. And we can self-examine all day long, and we can look inward all day long, and we can self-reflect to the point of shaming ourselves, and that's not the point. The point is to be better. The point is to make better choices. The point is that we get to start over because we have a God of second chances. So in the self-examination, let it always include the examination of the God filled with love and grace for us. Exodus 33, 18. Psalm 68, 28. Just a couple of those verses that you need to see. About great great powerful people of the faith who examined themselves and in light of their examination of themselves said, you know what, but God, you are strengthening me. You are bettering me and you love me. I have a, a friend who is currently battling cancer and every now and then I'll send her a text and I'm like, God is crazy madly in love with you. And she's like, you could never tell me that enough. Tell me again. 
And I'll send her back another text and say, he's crazy madly in love with you. Why is it important? Because sometimes we forget. Sometimes we forget. I want you to take you while we finish up. And this is the last point that I'm going to make. Because I had this written down and I don't want to forget it. I want you to hop over to Acts chapter 9. And this is really the Bible journaling section. <laughs> I know all of it was Bible journaling to some degree, but this is really where I want you to see some Bible journaling. I want you to go to Acts 9, three, uh, 9 verses 1 through 3. And this is the story of Paul. We're talking about Paul. We're talking about a man who had great faith, great integrity, a man that was a preacher, a man that was... Um, you know, a spokesman to the people, one that that was, um, he transcended generation after generation of a man of God who loved Jesus with his full heart, but he had a conversion. He used to prosecute, uh, persecute Christians, and he used to want for them to be dead. And he had this conversion. He had this transformation that happened to him on the road to Damascus. And this is just a, a small uh, overview of his conversion, but I want to read um, verses one through three with you as we finish up. And this is the last thing I'm going to say. Verses one through three of Acts chapter nine says this, meanwhile, Saul, because we know Paul's name before he was converted was Saul. Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any uh, of any followers of the Way, capital Way, he found there. He wanted to bring back both men and women back to Jerusalem in chains. This is the same Paul that you and I are learning so much about, who talks about running with great integrity the race that God has for us, and then being afraid in the end of being disqualified. This is the story of his conversion. This is the same Paul. This is the same man who was given a second chance to be a great for Jesus. To be a great for all Christians all over the world who would write over 75% of the New Testament. But there are some words I want you to circle here. If you're a circler in your Bible, I want you to circle these words. Saul was uttering threats. These are some action. These are some verbs I want you to circle. Uttering threats. Eager to kill. He went. He requested. Asking. Bring them. Bring them back in chains. All of these are action words of things that he was doing to persecute Christians. And yet it was that is it was with that same passion and intensity he would have that God would use those same skills, that same skill set to be the voice for people all over the world. It, it was with those same passions that fueled him in his stand against believers that Jesus would give him a second chance to use those very same things, those same disciplined qualities to work for the gospel and to use those same qualities to run with great fervor the race that Jesus had for him, to run with great passion to show the world a better way of living through his example. And that is great hope for you and I. That's great hope for you and I. So back to our original, our original verse. I run with purpose in every step. I run, I do not run aimlessly. I'm not just shadow boxing. I understand that there is a real race to be run here. And there is real quality of character that he is developing in me if I stay faithful, if I stay present, if I stay confident, if I stay excited, if I stay filled with passion, if I stay consistent across the board with my walk with Jesus, I know that there is no way that I can be disqualified. Jesus is crazy madly in love with you and I hope you know that. I hope you know that. I hope you can hear my heart say, you know what? 
this is a better way to live with Jesus. I hope you're hearing that loud and clear from my heart to yours. It is not shame. It's not condemnation. It's saying, join me in this race, will you? It's the best one that you will ever run. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for tonight. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the ways that you bring it alive to us every single time we're on this live event. Who says that Jesus can't show up on a Facebook live? You are so good. And you are so faithful. And Father God, I want to pray tonight specifically for the hearts that might be hearing the word of condemnation who might be hearing the word of shame from the enemy that is telling them that they are not enough, that they never will be, and that they should give up. I pray, Father God, that you would comfort them tonight in their thoughts. That, Father God, you would surround their home tonight with a word of, of comfort, reminding them, Father, that you love them with a radical love, and that you want to show mercy and kindness to them, and that you have been waiting for them to come home, that they have strayed too far away from your path. They have strayed too far from the race that you've mapped out for them. And Father God, I pray that you would comfort them and just bring them into a place of remembering why they're alive. I pray that you would erase the word disqualified from their, from their vocabulary, Father, and that they would know and feel you in a real, intangible way tonight, maybe for the first time in a long time, maybe for the first time ever. Father, I pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that you would guide them, that you would comfort them, that you would love them. And I pray, Father God, that you would surround them with a company of people that can uplift them, inspire them, and encourage them in their walk. And if they do not have people in their path right now, I pray, Father God, that you would send people in their path that can do so. The Father God, we would let go of all the weight that ties us down to this world because running with you is where we want to be. We don't want to be anywhere else. We love you, Jesus. And we thank you. We thank you for loving us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Thanks so much for being here tonight. I appreciate every single one of you. I love the comments that you've made in the in the comments section and I so look forward to seeing you again next week um, I just am praying for you and if you need anybody uh, to pray for you or with you or you just want to talk I'm always here my um, I'm always available you can always message me private message me I love you and I thank you and we will see you back here tomorrow on our journaling with Jesus page I love you all and have a great night bye